Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, my father, Mr. Packle. Welcome to Threshold of Hope, where we take a look at the writings of the church. First, I want to mention that today is the Feast of Our Lady of the Rosary. On one hand, this celebrates a very important event. Back in the 1570s, the Sultan of Turkey had sworn an oath that he would turn St. Peter's Basilica into a mosque and conquer all of Italy and the rest of Europe. And his fleet was stopped at the Battle of Lepanto by a smaller Christian fleet. But Pope Pius V had called the Christian world, and in those days it was a more and more divided Christian world, a lot of divisions within Christendom, but he called people to pray the rosary and intercede. And as the battle finished, he had a vision of Our Lady telling them that they had victory, and he found out a few days later that they had won. Uh, also in the admiral's ship, they had put one of the very early copies of Our Lady of Guadalupe, and that was inside his cabin, again, seeking her intercession. And this uh, we now celebrate as the Feast of Our Lady of the Rosary because of its effect. And, you know, to think back when a hundred years later, the Turkish, a different Turkish sultan, of course, swore that he would take Vienna. And it was King Jan Sobieski of Poland who saw the city surrounded and he raised high a banner with the image of Our Lady, rode into the Turkish camp and completely defeated them, preventing Europe from being taken over. So Our Lady's intercession is very, very important and we celebrate that on this feast of Our Lady of the Rosary and we need to pray the rosary. Remember, it's not only Christians at risk. At this very moment, a whole city of Kurdish people in Syria is under attack and they will be absolutely wiped out. Every one of them will be killed if they lose this battle. So pray for them. Pray for the safety of all the people, Muslim, Yazidi, and the uh, Christian. Uh, who are at risk in this, this present uh, Islamic State war and pray that they all be safe. Also, speaking of prayer, a good friend, Father Benedict Rochelle of the uh, Congregation of the Friars of the Renewal, passed away this last Friday on the vigil of the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi. I have no doubt that St. Francis was very, very much filled with joy to meet him. Father Grishel has been an old and good friend of Mother Angelica and the network. Um, the two of them were very bratty together. I remember when they used to have the um, stone, uh, the millstone awards that they would, that they <laughs> They would all give a, a, an award for the most scandalous person, you know, that they, they knew of inside the church who needed to have a millstone put around their neck so that they would not scandalize the least of Christ's people. And so he, he I'm sure, helped to instigate that with Mother, along with many other things. But Father Grishel uh, also was personally a great friend from the, uh, I, had, I was doing my third series when he came here the first time. And we hit it off right away, and he was just so filled with great wisdom and insight into a wide variety of things. Uh, of course, he had a great background as a psychologist, and he used that well. Well, there's going to be a prayer vigil for Father Grishel this coming Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And his funeral mass, will be this Friday, October 10th, at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. EW10 will televise these. Uh, it'll be a great thing, and I urge you, in order to learn more of the wisdom of this very great man, 
to take a look at some of the uh, DVDs of his television shows and series, uh, the books and meditations that he did. His, again, on this feast, to remember his rosary that he did, and we're still playing that. Um, I listened to that on the radio. And you can get all of that EWTN's religious catalog by going to EWTNRC.com or give them a call at 1-800-854-6316. And it get, it'll, it'll serve you well uh, to continue learning from his good and great wisdom. All right. We are on the document known as Fides et Ratio by St. John Paul II. You can get a paperback copy by going to EWTN's religious catalog, same uh, address, EWTNRC. Dot com. It's so much shorter than the old one. It used to be EWTNReligiousCatalog.com. EWTNRC.com is nice and short. Or you can also call them 1-800-854-6316. Or if you prefer, you can download a free electronic copy of Fetus at Ratio by going to our main website, EWTN.com. And when you go there, look up the, doc, the libraries, then click Document Library, and it'll ask you which ones. Write in Fides et Ratio, and it'll be right there. Now, of course, we want you to be involved and participate in our show. You can do so by coming here to Birmingham and being part of our audience like these nice folks have done. Or you can send a question by writing to threshold at EWTN.com. Or you can call during the live broadcast uh, the number inside North America is 1-800-221-9460. 1-800-221-9460. Or you can, if you're outside North America or inside Birmingham, call 205-271-2980. Remember, this is uh, live on Tuesday afternoon at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Now, last week, we started to um, uh, paragraph 91. And this was fairly dense. So we're going to continue on with 91.2. And it's a good place to start because he introduces uh, an interesting concept. Uh, you sometimes hear among philosophy professionals, but also others. He says, our age has been termed by some thinkers as the age of post-modernity, post-modernity or post-modern. Now, you say, you know, it's sort of odd to think of almost everywhere, contemporaries think of themselves as modern. Why do they come up with this word postmodern? The origin of it was in the late 1800s when you had a number of painters, mostly from France, I believe, who were using little dots to make their pictures, and just like in comics today. They call it comics that way. And when you stand back, then you see the picture. Well, that was modern. And so one liter uh, art critic called his new work postmodern. So he's dating it from there. Then you also see a development in the 1900s uh, of uh, modern architecture that was meant to be very efficient. Mies van der Rohe, who were doing a lot of his work in Chicago, and a number of others who uh, like Mies van der Rohe said, you, you do more with less. So basically, <laughs> what a lot of it looks like, they, they wanted no decoration. They were reacting against uh, some of the Art Deco of the 20s and 30s, and they were getting rid of all decoration, uh, that just make what we would just call boxes. That's what a lot of the buildings look like, milk cartons. 
standing upright with windows made out of steel and glass. And that's why you see that style. And uh, this was used as the modern approach to architecture, where you plan huge neighborhoods with all these apartment buildings and blocks. But as happened, and this is a, 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 what some people call a turning point, in St. Louis, where they had these in the housing projects for poor people, mostly African-American, it was such a thorough catastrophe that they started blowing them up. And now they've done that all over. Why? It's, they're ugly places to live. You can't start a business. You can't move out of your poverty living in these crammed quarters. I know 16 t stories high. We had that in the housing projects in Chicago. And there were miles, you know, the Robert Taylor homes um, that were just awful, awful situations. And, you know, gangs and all this stuff. So when they started blowing them up, then they started talking about postmodern architecture. But then, using this as an analogy, you also began to see people in the 1950s and 60s talking about postmodern society, not just paintings, not just buildings, but now society. And part of that was the sexual revolution. I mean, why should we go with old forms of family, such as a husband, wife, and children? Why not just let it be free, whatever you want it to be? And we had the sexual revolution of the 60s. And the drug revolution. Why should we have sobriety, reason, and logic as the norm for the state of consciousness? Why not do alternative states of consciousness called being high? We'll see how that makes things better. And all sorts of other, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, in philosophy, uh, deconstructionalism, where you just get rid of the meaning of words and say whatever I feel a word is, that's what it is. Because Postmodernism was about whatever I feel. As a matter of fact, what it was doing is giving a name to a culture based on narcissism, it's all about me, and a culture based on relativism. There is no truth. There's no absolute truth. So that's what they call postmodernity. That's what he's talking about here. And so, uh, again, they, we, they portray us as living in a post modern world. How's that working out for you? You know? Yeah, the drug, the, the, the drug culture. Oh, big, big improvement. You know, getting rid of the Bible and religion in schools. Big improvement. Now you have metal detectors to find the guns and the knives. You know, so, but I digress. Often, used in very different contexts, like I just mentioned, sometimes architecture, sometimes art, sometimes philosophy, sometimes sociology, all these different ways they use the word postmodern. The term des designates the emergence of a complex set of new factors in culture, like the breakdown of family. So, in, in, I always like to point out, in 1940, 4% of children were born to unwed mothers. 1960, 5%. Nine, uh, 2010, 43%. Which is the primary accounting for poverty and where there's crime increase, that's the primary cause. Not race, because it goes across the races. The issue is parents not raising their children together and helping each other in the process. So um, these are widespread and powerful factors that have changed our society and done a lot of damage. That's why, uh, again, 80% of all people in prison are the children of an unwed mother. That's amazing. And most of the other 20% come from divorced families. Widows don't have that problem. But in divorced families, it's bad. In unwed motherhood, it's really bad. And the smallest per percentage of people in prison are the children of an intact family. 
But that doesn't stop. You know, and these kind of results don't stop people thinking, well, we just have to be open-minded about all these new forms of family and make family whatever you feel like, even though it leads to catastrophe. And that's why these factors are very widespread and very powerful. And they show themselves able to produce important and lasting changes. Notice he doesn't say improvements. This hasn't made society better. We don't see that people no more do they. The internet, has it made people better informed? No, I'm afraid not. The, there's more information available. That's for sure. It's amazing and wonderful. But people have not become more informed because thinking, knowing facts, knowing history, those are postmodern, or those are modern ideas, and we're in a postmodern world. We don't need them anymore. Why know facts and figures anymore? Why memorize the multiplication tables or anything? So that's all part of this postmodern sense. The term postmodern was first used with reference to aesthetic, that is art, and social and technological phenomena. But it was then transposed to philosophy, where in philosophy it has remained somewhat ambiguous. Well, how can it not be ambiguous if part of Postmodernism is a philosophy that says you have the meaning of the words you use. A word means what you want it to mean. It doesn't have real meaning in itself. This is a philosophy called deconstruction that became very popular in, especially in English literature uh, departments around the country. And so if you make a word mean whatever you want it to be, whatever you feel like, then of course there's going to be confusion even about what post-modernity means. Because they're, as we say in my neighborhood, they're making it up as they go. So, and making it whatever they want it to be. And because it's ambiguous, the judgment on what is called postmodern is sometimes positive, sometimes negative, because there's no consensus on what is the time when postmodernity begins. Again, its first use is in the 1870s, but in uh, uh, architecture, it's in the 1960s, but some people say in society it's after World War II. And so they, they, they can't agree on what it is what, how to define it, when it began, what it includes, etc. But it gets vaguely used by people who say, oh, well, we're in a postmodern world. And, you know, we're just sort of floating through air like a piece of uh, dust that you can see once the sunlight is on it. And that's why I'm in favor of pointing more and more light on this so you can see that it's just a bunch of floating pieces of dust, ideologically speaking. One thing, however, is certain. The currents of thought which claim to be postmodern merit appropriate attention. We do have to pay attention to what they mean, like um, deconstructionalism and how they, what they do to deconstruct, that is, take apart words so that they end up meaning whatever you feel like it means. We have to pay attention to that. According to some postmodernists, the time of certainty is irrevocably past. They say, oh, yes, you know, in the modern era and, the, and before modernity, people were very certain about what's right and wrong. But today, we're more enlightened. We don't know what the heck right and wrong is anymore. But isn't that the case? How many times do you hear, well, how can you be so judgmental? I mean, think of Jerry Springer as the everyday catechist of post-modernity. 
Don't judge anybody, just accept them as they are. Meanwhile, they're describing this chaos of relationships that live all around this world. They're throwing chairs, he has to have bouncers. Do you notice I don't have any bouncers for you? <laughs> Not that I couldn't take care of it myself. No, no, <laughs> but we don't need to. <laughs> Because we're not throwing our chairs around at each other. Um, th this is not the case. But Jerry Springer really is the catechist. The way he gets away with having a lot of these different discussions that are obscene. Sometimes I, I saw in the news, I didn't even see the show, but I saw in the news that he had people who were stark naked, a mom and her son who lived in the clothes. And so they came to the show that way and were parading around. Clothes were such an improvement. At any rate, but there I go being judgmental, and Jerry wouldn't like that. And that's what he does at the end of his show. He says, now just don't be judging anybody. That is the catechism of post-modernity. On a popular level, there are people in the elites who do it on other levels, but he does it for the masses. You'd do better if you went to Mass. <laughs> so this is something that since certainty about good, bad, truth, God, etc., is gone, they, they try to teach that human beings must now learn to live in a horizon, that is, in, in an existence of total absence of meaning. It's just what fun you can have now. There's no purpose, because as soon as you talk about purpose for what you're doing, it means you must, and that's why I use the word horizon, you must look beyond the horizon of what you can see right now and try to figure out where you are going in life. Is there a meaning to where I'm going? to where my life is going, where other people's lives are going? Does it have some goal? And that's going to be beyond what I can see in the horizon of what's visible to me. Remember, think of this image. Philosophers use it a lot, that there's a horizon. It's as far as you can see with the naked eye. And that is a good symbol of how much you can understand just from your own raw experience, just what you know by experience. That's just a horizon. But as all of us know, and as human beings have always suspected, that beyond the horizon, there's something more. That's why human beings settled all the continents except Antarctica. They left that for the penguins. But the, but the penguins got there. They didn't start there, but they got there. And they are welcome to it. But the, but the rest of the continents, even Australia, was inhabited by folks looking beyond their horizon and assuming there's more and coming to a whole continent where there were man-eating birds. And there were birds that were six, seven, eight feet that would eat you, but they, they you know, helped make them extinct before they made the people extinct. And they lived there and so on all around the world. Well, there's also horizons to all of life and what's beyond it? What's the purpose? <coughs> Excuse me. Postmodern people don't think of a purpose or meaning beyond what their own immediate experience is. And when, and that's, this also is very important because it's partly what explains their desire to say, look, I don't see why I should suffer in my last illness assuming this is my last illness, so I'll kill myself. That's why they promote suicide and want us to legalize it. They don't see anything. And this is part of their problem. They see everything is provisional and ephemeral. Everything is just here for a moment. And, you know, I, I've noticed this. I, I did my doctoral studies down in Nashville, Tennessee. And one of the things I've noticed is that when you get to grunge bands and a lot of these other bands that are come, they, they just come and go. Whereas with country bands, 
you know, uh, and singers. I mean, people still love George Jones, and he died. But, you know, they, were, they loved him for decades, as, as crazy as he was. They still loved him for decades. And uh, Loretta Lynn and all these other people. It's not so ephemeral, but in this modern form of music, it's very common to have one-hit wonders. They have one song, then they're gone. And the, the record company makes a fast buck off them because they're ephemeral. They, they're just a wisp. And then you go to the next one. And as uh, I overheard uh, Dr. Ray Grendy saying, uh, from one of his, quoting one of his daughters, he said, uh, look, uh, why don't you listen to the music I bought you on the CD? He said, oh, Dad, that was so old last month. It's done. I, I, I'll be out of it. It's not a matter of, do you like the music? No, it's in or not. And it makes no difference as to whether it really touches my soul. It's rather my friends like it now. And when they stop liking it, I stop liking it. And, it's, and, it's, and, the, and that's when the music company drops on like a hot potato. This is, um, that's why they consider country music uh, modern or pre-modern or <laughs> absolutely antiquated. In their destructive critique of every certitude, because that's what they do. They try to destroy everything you believe is certain. There was a group uh, called EST, Earhart Seminar Trainings. That was what they did to people. They got you to, uh, they would critique everything you held as certain and then try to reshape you. That was exactly what they did. Now, they were ephemeral. They're out of business. As far as I know, they're out of business. So in the destructive critique of every certitude, several authors have failed to make crucial distinctions and have called into question the certitudes of faith. They, they, they don't believe in God, and they want to do everything they can to make sure you don't believe in God and that you don't have a morality based on what God has revealed. That's too certain. And they fear that if you are certain about what God has revealed, then you will become oppressive. So they end up becoming oppressive to stop you from being oppressive. Again, try to say a prayer for a football team at a high school today. And the political correct anti-God police come in and say this is absolutely forbidden. That's why you can scratch a postmodernist's thin veneer and easily find a dictator or a fascist underneath. This, uh, the, and they'll say absurd things. I remember watch, just watching an interview in one, which one woman, uh, I don't know if she was a lawyer or not, but she was part of the, she was at an ACLU uh, convention. And she said, well, what do you, they asked her, uh, what do you think we should do to stop uh, terrorism? She said, well, look, terrorism is the only way these people know how to get you and me to listen. So it's not bad. Well, that gives you an idea of at least her values, not maybe not the whole organization, I, hopefully not, but certainly her values. She couldn't even be certi have any certitude that terrorism Murder and cutting people's heads off is wrong. And so um, this is something that we have to deal with. So this is an example as post-modernity is nihilism, which is saying everything is nothing. Nothingness is all there is for them. That a nihil is the Latin word for nothing. So they believe in nothingism. It's just easier to say it with the Latin word nihilism in that this nihilism has been justified by the terrible experiences of evil in our age. I mean, you think of the horrors of the anti-religious Nazis. You think of the even worse horrors. Remember, the Nazis were amateurs compared to atheistic communism. Nazis executed 10 million people. Atheistic communism executed 
at least 140 to 150 million people, and maybe much more. Just 62 million in Russia, 75 million at least in China, 2 million in Cambodia. And so they look and say, well, this is terrible. Well, do you notice that there's a pattern? This wasn't the religious people, certainly not the Christians. This was the atheists doing this. And as such, um, they say, well, this is, you know, you have these terrible evils, so there's no meaning in life. Well, yeah, these are people who gave up God as the source of meaning. And then they do this stuff, and you criticize thinking and meaning and religion and faith? This is crazy. It's, it's all backwards. Such a dramatic ex, uh, experience has ensured the collapse of rationalist optimism. Remember, that's what people were. They were optimistic. We're going to make a perfect Nazi society, a so national socialist society. That was Hitler's plan. And the Volkswagen was a good idea. So was the uh, interstate, the Autobahn. The communists were making a perfect society. But that, that optimism without values, without God, without certitude of what's right and wrong, without beauty, that brought about a horrible collapse of that optimism. And, uh, and this was a raw optimism that used to look upon history as the reason is going to triumph over everything. No reason, just found new ways to do wider spread evil. And they saw, uh, and that reason would be the source of all happiness and freedom, but it became a, cat a nightmare. Catastrophe is too mild. It was an utter nightmare under atheism and Nazism. And so, and this is, uh, and now people respond to that false optimism with despair. They go to uh, the opposite with pessimism. So it remains true that a certain type of positivist cast of mind, positivists just see uh, only the stuff I can see in front of me. You can prove to me positively. I can feel it, see it, taste it, touch it, hear it. That's what positivists do. That continues to nourish the illusion that science and technology will help human beings live as demiurges. They'll be like little gods. That was one of the things. What it, what did the nihilist philosopher uh, of Nietzsche say? We'll make supermen. That's, Hitler used that term. We're going to have the, the Übermensch, the superman. And people will be able to take care of their own destiny and do what they want. But that's not reality. And post-modernity has not done anything to help our situation any more than that false optimism from rationalism did. We need God. We need faith in Him and the truth that He reveals about being human. All right, let's take a break. We'll come back in just a couple of minutes and get your questions and questions from our st studio audience and emails. So please stay with us. <laughs> Thank you very much and welcome back. First of all, I want to uh, invite you to do what these nice folks have done, which is come here to Irondale, Alabama uh, on a pilgrimage. Uh, you can contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966 or go to the website EWTN.com. They'll give you information about the scheduling of uh, the masses programs, tours of the studio, directions to Hansville to go to the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament up there and where the sisters live, and places to stay and places to eat. Uh, matter of fact, one of these folks here, a couple from uh, 
Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, we're really impressed with the fine barbecue you have down here in Alabama. So we'd love to have you come over here for all that. Also want to invite you. Uh, we still have a few more seats left for my pilgrimage to the Holy Land, which will be December 15th to the 26th. If you are interested, go to my website, which is fathermitchpacwa.org, and the word father is spelled out, fathermitchpacwa.org, or you can call the, the uh, travel agent at 1-800-554-4554. Six. Now, before we get to our questions, we want to mention a milestone that happened here in Birmingham this past Sunday. Holy Rosary Catholic Church in the Gate City community of Birmingham celebrated their 125th anniversary. Bishop Robert Baker of the Diocese of Birmingham, along with Pastor Brian Jarabic and the Salesian Reverend Anthony D'Angelo, celebrated the 125th anniversary Mass on Sunday. The Holy Rosary Catholic Church was built 125 years ago to accommodate about 80 people as a mission of St. Saint, Saint Paul's Cathedral, at the time it was St. Paul's Parish, uh, here in Birmingham. And the first prisoners were Belgian and Irish. It became one of the first racially integrated congregations in the area, and then became its own parish in 1955, when it was placed under the care of the Salesians of St. Don Bosco. Now, most of the past 25 years, the Salesians ran a ministry to the youth called Oratories as a place to pray and play. Starting in 1986, Brother Charles Total uh, recruited Salesian lay missionaries and volunteers from across the country to work in the mission. The youth oratory grew into an after-school program and a summer-long day camp. The emergency food service program became a food pantry and a closed closet, helping a lot of folks because the neighborhood is still fairly poor. This year, the two remaining Salesian priests relocated back to their U.S. provincial headquarters, withdrawn from Holy Rosary. The youth oratory, food pantry, and closed closet is now owned and administered by the Diocese of Birmingham. Holy Rosary serves food and clothing to over 250 families from the Gate City and Woodlawn communities every month. And it operates a youth program for the children from the neighboring Marks Village housing community in Gate City. So it's great work, a long history, and may they continue to do that service. All right, let us now take a look at our first caller. Hello, James. Hello. James, Hello. are you there? Yes, can you hear me? I don't hear him. Hello? Oh, there you are. Hi, James. Where are you from? Erie, Pennsylvania. Oh, good to talk to you. And what's your question? Well, as we know, October is Respect Life Month, so how do we convince people to follow God's higher, the highest laws, divine laws, and the higher law, the natural moral law, as opposed to people, they, they say, you know, they try to justify the lack of legal protection for the conceived babies by abortion mm -hmm. and other, you know, mm -hmm. unnatural marriage and violations of true ethical health insurance. You know, they try to justify saying that's the law of the land. How do we convince them to follow the higher law, indeed God's highest law? Even the Declaration of Independence uh, proposes that. Thank okay, you. sure. Now, there are two ways in which we can do this. First, on one hand, you need to begin by convincing them that serving God and loving God is much more long-lasting than life on earth or even more long-lasting than the United States government. At some point, the United States will cease to exist. It's not eternal. But the soul of the person you're talking to is eternal. Kingdoms come and go. Kingdoms, governments, legal systems are mortal. Individual souls are not. And they need to say, 
am I willing to follow God's law and live with Him in all eternity, to love God with my whole heart, mind, and soul, to believe in what He says? If they don't want to do that, why would they listen to your argument about God's law superseding human law? They have no base reason for it. If God is equal to the state, what's the big deal? So that's your first step. Secondly, then you can go and have them look. First of all, abortion is a decision based on nine men in the Supreme Court saying that they were not sure that a child in the womb is a human person. That's, and so, and they didn't make it a law. What they did was decriminalize abortion. That's the first step. Secondly, you can say, all right. Matter of fact, what you may want to do is go to my website, um, fathermitchpacwa.org, where I have a CD explaining this more in detail called The Supreme Court and Human Dignity. And here's is one of the, uh, the next step of the argument. The U.S. Supreme Court not only upheld slavery in the Dred Scott decision, but in the same Dred Scott decision said that African Americans are inherently inferior to Caucasians. That was your Supreme Court decision. Do you still believe that the Supreme Court has the power to determine human dignity. And then it wasn't but 40 years after that decision, Plessy versus Ferguson comes along and says, yes, you can have separate but equal facilities for blacks and for um, uh, whites. And what did that lead to? A series of Jim Crow laws in which the state said, oh, yeah, we'll do separate but equal. And, uh, yeah, equal, let's see, who's going to define equal? Uh, I will. And so I say that's equal, but that's better. You know, I mean, the Jim Crow laws led to horrendous situations for African Americans. Based on Plessy versus Ferguson, even President Woodrow Wilson, considered one of the most liberal pre presidents in our history. He was afraid he might not win the Democratic Party nomination if he did not support Jim Crow. So he made executive orders by his own uh, will. He had, didn't have a, yeah, he had a phone and a pen. And with his phone and his pen, Woodrow Wilson said that no African American is allowed to work in any way, any form for the federal government. Not even in ancillary businesses that have contracts with the federal government. Now, are your friends going to say, well, that was the law of the land, and the president made those decrees? Not unlike the way President Barack Obama makes decrees about, we'll give you foreign aid if you let us teach your women how to have abortions and birth control. Same deal. So is this the law because, and therefore good because they said so? I say no. That we have to judge Dred Scott, Plessy versus Ferguson, by higher values than they could find in their so-called constitutional decisions. And that we have to use God's law to recognize African Americans have inherent human dignity given to them, not by the state, and therefore not able to be taken away by the Supreme Court. And infants conceived in women's wombs have the same dignity. The state doesn't give it to them, and the Supreme Court has no more right to take it away than they had the right to take away the equal dignity of African Americans. That's where I would go. Ma'am, where are you from? 
I'm from Kentucky, Father. Good to have you here. And your question? Yes, Father, earlier you had mentioned that this postmodern uh, idea is cause they had built structures that they were using um, as housing and that it right. didn't work. Right. And didn't that they work. eventually it was a catastrophe. They blew them up. Yes. So I want to know how can we blow up this idea that family and marriage is not a good thing? Yep. Here's, here's going to be one of the things. What we can, you know, I already mentioned this, there's some issues showing that actually the redefinition of family, as you, if you would call it that, that redefinition is itself blowing up the culture. We don't want any more blowing up. <laughs> They're blowing it up themselves. And to, to be politically incorrect about stating the data, because, you know, it doesn't fit the politically correct agenda to say, here are the effects. A classic example of that is back in 1993. An article was printed in Atlantic Monthly called Dan Quayle Was Right. In which, uh, and, and what, what did the article say? It showed a whole list of problems that come when children are raised by a single parent, which in the great majority of cases is the mom. Though now it's moving more and more to the grandparents. But be that as it may, the, um, it just listed the studies showing the catastrophe for the daughters become unwed mothers, from unwed mothers drug use, violence, gang membership, all this stuff, and imprisonment, all these things, it was there. They had that information a year before, but because Dan Quayle had criticized the redefinition of marriage. Remember when um, Murphy Brown chose to be an unwed mother and this said, he said, you're making a mistake, using this as an example for our young women. And everybody came down on him. Well, Atlantic Monthly had that article proving that he was right. But they didn't want to support him politically. So they didn't publish it till after the election cycle was done and, and President Clinton was inaugurated. Now, we have to say these things whether they think it's correct or not politically. The issue is what is it doing to our society? And let that be known. Secondly, we then have to do a lot of education about marriage, human sexuality, the facts of life they don't tell you in the uh, government-run school system uh, sex ed programs, such as the increased use of condoms and the pill run the same uh, uh, curve uh, on the graph of the increase of sexually transmitted diseases. The more condoms and, and contraceptive pills they sell, the more sexual transmitted diseases grow. And that, 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 that's not politically correct. But it's the statistics show that because people take higher risks when they're told that this is safe sex. And they say, no, safe sex is wait until you're married, stay faithful to your spouse, love your spouse, and the children you two bring into the world. That is safety. And this is what we have uh, as our, our task. We have another question from our studio. And sir, where are you from? Deacon Dennis from the Holy Lands of Kentucky. Ain't you something? Yes, are you with uh, this uh, young lady here? Oh, that's my beautiful bride. Good Aren't you God. a lucky man? I now, am. what's your question? Yes, uh, I am involved in jail ministry, and mm -hmm. I, I, your fact of 80% of our unwed mothers and uh, or as far as the result of unwed mothers. And I would agree it's very high. I didn't know 80%, that's, that's amazing. But uh, well, the other thing that I realize is that most of them are in there because of drug and alcohol problems. Yep. And that's probably because of the, some of the same effects. But I heard someone recently say that when the violence has to do with their fathers did not affirm them. Their fathers were not there to give them the affirmation that they were good. And uh, as my question to you is how can we, can, how can I and how can the church and people respond to these people to let them know that they are good and holy and made in God's image and yeah. likeness? You know, well, first of all, I think that we have to remember that the violence isn't just 
because their fathers didn't say how great they were and tell them that they're good kids. Our fathers affirm us in a wide variety of ways, sometimes by an embrace, sometimes by uh, getting contact with you low enough and hard enough to make sure you don't do it again. <laughs> and there, there's, there's a point, you know, there's a point where our boys, especially boys, but girls too, are they going to say, yeah, the guys in my neighborhood, they tell me the way life really is. Or is it your dad who not only tells you the way life is, but if you cross the line, this is what you get. But also, I'm there to affirm you. And even when you are acting like a complete fool, I'm your father. But, you know, you're being a fool. And says that it's that whole experience, not just an affirmation. And this is one of the things that we can do as a church in the ministry that you're doing in jail. To have a right, uh, I did a show on EWTN Live a couple of years ago with a bunch of ranchers. There are two of them were here, but there's about 20 ranchers out in Texas who go to the prison and they give retreats, but they keep going and they show a man's love for these guys. That is a fatherly kind of love that shows them, we like you guys, but we're also going to tell you the facts about life in terms of heaven, hell, purgatory, right, wrong, good, and beauty. We're going to tell you all that. And these guys, they, need, they do need affirmation, you know, positive affirmation. That when they go to the prison, I'm sure you see this too, the, the, the inmates will say, you know, you didn't give me my hug yet. They didn't get that from their dad. You know, a dad holding his baby and just cherishing that and just, just holding him. And dads sitting on a tractor with their sons on their lap. Dads driving with their kids and just talking. All the stuff that you don't have quality time. It's everyday time. They need that. And to have a community of folks working with you in the prison so that you don't do it all. You can't but a community of guys who just, you know, like they, they, these are just ranchers who, you know, say, look, we're going to do something here. And they had, in one year, over 130 converts to Catholicism. And the warden is delighted because the place is becoming like a monastery. It's a, it's a high security prison. And they're in the uh, high, high security cell block. And that's where the, it's happened. To Two of the uh, lifers, both in there for, for killing, have decided, you know, they, they converted. They said, look, I'm here for the rest of my life. My mission from God is to stay here and teach people the scriptures. So they're both getting online degrees in scripture, learning Latin and Greek, so they can teach the Bible the rest of their life while they're in prison. This is possible. And this is one, and the same thing before they get to prison. Our schools and other ministries, you know, have to be there for these young people to say, you know, yeah, we love you. Now, like the nuns, you know, I went to public school for a couple of years, then Catholic school. And the nuns didn't take any nonsense, but you could tell they loved us. And even though there were 50 to 60 kids in a class, with one nun, we were totally outnumbered. And, you know, this was, you know, and they loved us, but there's no nonsense either. And that sense of being truly parental is going to be part of the mission of the church. The way the old Benedictine monks went to the barbarians and turned them into Europeans by bringing them Christ. That's what we also have to see in our cities, schools, etc. That's the mission we have. But we are out of time. So uh, let me give you a blessing. May Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you. Let's also pray for Father Grishel. Eternal rest grant unto Him, O Lord, and may the perpetual light shine upon Him. May His soul and all the souls of the faithful departed through the mercy of God Rest in peace. Amen.
Mighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And again, remember to keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and we'll be able to pay our bills too. Thank you, and God bless.